make up the fact that I haven't introduced uh, lecturers and scholars very um, well to say that I think they've all done a marvellous job. And I want to especially thank Adrienne Martin who's looked after our door all these eight weeks. So she's had a double job. Um, but anyway, our lecturers tonight are Janet Bailey and Ethel McCready who are the co-curators of Witness to Change, the book and the exhibition. And they're both very knowledgeable people as curators and writers and editors. So we're privileged <coughs> to have them come tonight. Janet. Thanks. For those of you who don't know what Witness to Change, what Witness to Change is, um, this is a catalogue for an exhibition which we curated for Photo Forum Wellington in 1985, um, and it's been touring the country since 85. Um, it's presently just finished in Dunedin, and we're hoping that it will come to Auckland later this year probably at the Fisher Gallery, but I'm afraid I don't um, have those dates confirmed. So um, we're going to present this talk in three parts. First of all, we'll talk about briefly about the hows and whys of the exhibition, how we got it underway, because it was a fairly long gestation period, and it might interest some of you to know, you know how we sort of got to the end point of the exhibition and the catalogue. <coughs> um, <clears throat> we'll introduce some of the issues that we came across along the way in curating it. Um, and secondly, we'll go on to show some slides from the final exhibition, including some of the work that um, was in the albums but not reproduced in this catalogue, and also some background work. And we'll probably talk um, at this point about some of the issues dealing with why certain work was selected and why others weren't. And thirdly, we'll deal with some of the issues raised by three reviewers of the catalogue about social documentary work in general. Um, so if at the end of um, those first two sections you want to ask any specific questions, do so. And then at the end we'll have a more general discussion about some of the issues, hopefully. Okay. Um, well, I'm just going to talk about mechanics, as Janet says. <coughs> um, the first, the way this actually started, Janet and I um, were involved at all, it was something that Sharon Black, who was then running Photo Forum Gallery in Wellington, initiated. And the reason why she did that was to, it was a means of generating money for Photo Forum that the only way that Photo Forum Wellington could continue as a gallery was to uh, have commercial sponsorship, or at least it was the only way it could see so at the time. Um, and one of the easiest ways it seemed to, to get sponsorship was to have a very specific um, project like this. So that's how it started. And Sharon left the gallery, went to Australia, um, basically out of frustration because it really wasn't successful in those terms and nothing much was happening in terms of sponsorship. She was trying around the place and nothing uh, was coming through. So uh, approaches had been made to AGDC, which is the Art Gallery Directors Council, and there was some sort of lukewarm interest there. And when Sharon left, Janet and I took it up. So uh, we continued with that. We weren't very keen with Sharon's original proposal. It was a bit it was one, like a lot of proposals, which is um, conceived in terms of um, as a proposal rather than, rather than taking some work and making the exhibition. It was the other way around. It was sort of thinking what would be a good idea for an exhibition and then trying to find some work to fit into that, into that slot and it doesn't really work. So um, we came up with an idea which was uh, something similar to what was to change. It was, um, 
basically an idea, I think, to explore um, photography, well, as in the period 1940 to 65. Um, partly for personal reasons, I think, because it was a period which we'd both grown up through, and we wanted, uh, you know, a, a, you know, being young childhood, um, sort of to try to find out more about that period because it's a time, you know, um, you're not really very aware, perhaps, of a lot of things that happened. Um, so, okay, so then we went back to AGDC and uh, bought a proposal. They didn't like it. They got upset that we changed the thing. So it all went into limbo for about two years or something like that. So I guess it must have started in 1981, something like that. 1980? It started in 80 and was picked up again in 82. Yeah, okay. All right, so we started uh, going to the Turnbull where John Pascoe's negatives are held. There are about um, 9,000, I believe, negatives there. Arns Wester's negs were also held there. There's um, 50,000 individual negatives, I believe, and those, those into contact sheets of 12 each. Um, and we started looking at Les Cleveland's work. We also started investigating other people who were around at the time. I remember talking to John Turner at this time uh, about other photographers working in that 1940 to 65 period. Um, so we, things were sort of starting to come together like that. And then we, so then we had to figure out how we're actually going to do it financially. Um, the obvious thing again was commercial sponsorship because we wanted to do a good quality catalogue. We wanted to publish the images. That was really quite an important part for us. Um, you know, I mean, the whole sort of uh, reason for doing it was to, to get, uh, to make visible images which uh, at that stage were sitting in people's files uh, in the Turnbull and various other places completely um, unknown really. So to do a catalogue requires big bucks. We also needed to have the images printed. Um, again, it costs money. Uh, I'd done a previous show, the <coughs> Leslie Atkin show, um, basically just printing them with Gene Stanton uh, and that you know, just about killed us really and I swore I'd never do that again without being paid for it. We still were. And we still weren't really adequately paid, and as it turned out. So those were things there that we needed money for. And just our plain time in doing all this, I guess, again, I, you know, I swore that I'd never really do something like this without getting some, something back financially. So, uh, and then, of course, we wanted to tour the show. That was another way of getting the images around the, the place, and we couldn't do that, and Photo Forum couldn't do that. So that was, that was really the AGDC approach, that was because they are a touring body. Um, they never really came through. We spent years and years and years going backwards and forwards and trying to penetrate the bureau bureaucracy. They had endless committees of, you know, and subcommittees of committees and it was very Kafkaesque, I guess, and it was amazing. So in the end, um, Bill Milbank of the Sergeant Gallery came through and he said, yes, he'd just toured himself, you know, the Sergeant Gallery would just send it around and skip all the bureaucracy. So that solved that problem. The other problem was uh, an initiating gallery, because on a touring circuit you need someone who's going to put up the money for the frames, for the mats, um, perhaps nationwide uh, advertising such as Art New Zealand, various other things like the wall panels, the labels, <coughs> typesetting for that sort of stuff. And Seddon and Bennington came um, to the party there. He said he'd like to do that. So that solved that problem. And the final problem was the sponsorship. We didn't really feel very confident about approaching um, big business ourselves. Um, so we, I think we delayed that decision for a long, long time, really, longer than we should have. And in the end, we were, got so involved with doing the research that we decided to get Martin Taylor, who was quite good at fronting up to um, business organisations. And uh, he started working on that. We did work with him. And he approached many companies, uh, well, quite a few anyway, and had just about given up in despair when Government Life said they would be interested. Um, they were quite nervous about it, I think, because they'd never done any sponsorship before. I don't think any sort of sponsorship had they. No. And they, they just knew they didn't want to do sport. So arts seemed a possibility. 
and I think Martin sold him the idea that uh, this was about people and uh, about history of New Zealand in some sense, and that's that sort of fitted in with their, their image they wanted to project was being an insurance company, you know, about people and being government life about New Zealand people. So they were quite keen on that aspect. Um, what happened next? Printing. Um, I did Anne's, um, Les Cleveland and John Pascoe's prints, and Anne's printed her own work. And to find the money for that, we needed to sell the, all those prints. So we hawked those around for a while. Um, well, actually, we thought about it for quite a long time, and eventually <laughs> we approached the Auckland City Gallery rather <coughs> nicely, and they said yes straight away. It's quite surprising, really. Um, and I, was, uh, I, I talked to Rodney Wilson about this, and he said, oh, well, I assumed that there's only one, going to be one set available, and I said yes at the time, thinking, oh, yes, OK. Um, but then when I got back to Wellington, Martin and Janet disagreed and thought we have, should have a bit more flexibility. I think you don't both I can't disagree. Remember. No, well, Martin. I couldn't hear that, but Apple. Well, um, yes, OK. Um, I guess there was a bit of internal disagreement about whether we should sell only one copy of each image, one print of each photograph. Um, or have you know, a bit of flexibility to sell, do what we like with the sale of prints. And we decided we'd rather have a, a flexibility there than be dictated to by the city gallery. So we told them this, and they turned, on that basis, they turned us down. They said, well, they, they didn't want to buy them if, um, if any other gallery was going to be buying them as well. Um, they'd already been caught out in the Glen Bush, they felt, because uh, Glenn had sold his working men portfolio to the National Art Gallery um, and then also <coughs> sold, I think possibly, the whole portfolio again to the Auckland City. And Tremble. Yeah. And the, the city wasn't aware that it had already been sold. I mean, when I say already been sold, that you know, a set had been sold. <coughs> and they didn't, they didn't like that idea. Um, so they um, turned us down there. And we were rather stuck for some time. We were all, I think we were already printing. In fact, we, yeah, I think they were all already printed, basically. Um, and then uh, the National Art Gallery said that they would buy them after quite a bit of uh, difficult discussion, I might add. Uh, I think the, 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 the difficulty there was that they didn't want to buy something that we were just giving them. You know, they wanted to select from the portfolio. And as usual, they have that problem with documentary versus artistic yeah. images, yeah. Um, which is sort of the same question. Yeah. But they didn't want to act as an archive, uh, which is a dilemma they have uh, with a lot of bodies of work, particularly you know, they were still trying to define um, their boundaries in terms of how far do we go back in the history of photography before we become mm. a history museum rather than an art museum, so they were still trying to define that. Yeah, there's a sort of de facto policy of not buying work pre roughly 1970, I suppose, or 1960 at least. But it's actually stretched back to 1920, and Witness to Change was part of that. Yeah, um, they already owned the Adkin collection, which is not mostly 1920s and 30s work, and also some work by Gordon Burt, 1930s. I think that was purchased somewhat reluctantly as well. So they were, they were sort of being squeezed into something. Yeah. Um, OK, so that's all that organised, really. And I think it was, was, it, was on the road, rails from then on, wasn't it? Well, the other issue was uh, when government life sponsorship came through, uh, was whether to go with them and do the catalogue yeah, or go right. with Denton Ross, who yeah. had offered or were interested at that stage in um, publishing. And yeah. of course, in, in the sort of intermediate 18 months to two years in which all this discussion is going on, the printing prices keep escalating. So yeah. you have to keep going back to people and saying, oh, sorry, but um, they've gone up another sort of 50% and so we need another, you know. Yeah, I think when it was costed in 1980, we were talking about three, four, five thousand, and that was all in Jewett home too, wasn't it? Yeah, and... Six at the most. In 1985, yeah. it cost 20 plus thousand. Yeah, 20 to 30. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we, we, want, we had to figure out whether we wanted to do the production ourselves uh, or, or just go to a commercial publisher and Benton Ross, as Janet says, were interested. Um, but we really thought we'd rather be involved because it would be a learning experience for us and more importantly that we'd have some control over how well it was printed and how it was designed and all those things which you just don't have with, well you often don't have with a commercial publisher. Do you want to talk about the realities of that? Well, that, yeah, the, the reality was different. Um, part, well, we, you get into personalities a bit here. Um, basically, we didn't learn much and we didn't have much control, but I think it was... <laughs> um, oh, we were a bit idealistic about it, as I think um, a lot of people are when they think about some kind of self-publishing, you know, that, gee, it would be nice to... And we both had some, I suppose, amateur sort of layout design experience and we thought we had a few ideas. Yeah. Um, but one, I guess, in, in most respects, for, this, for its time, this really is an exemplary production in terms of design and reproduction. But the, the part that we were most disappointed with uh, was the cover and the catalogue, uh, the, sorry, the poster to advertise it. Um, and it's difficult at the time when you're dealing with someone who is very cert has very strong design ideas and aesthetic and very, very high standards to question. Um, and I think I learned out of that that you simply have to speak up and say, well, I don't understand this. Um, I don't understand why you've made that decision. Can you explain it? Or I don't like it. And be prepared to have some head bashing. Um, which can be sort of quite heavy, especially when you're working under tight time deadlines, as we really were, and it added a great deal of extra stress to the whole process. But in the end, what we feel um, that Brian Moss did with this catalogue is, is sort of turn the photograph into a work of art by putting a, a quasi-frame around it that sort of somehow legitimised it in a way that it didn't need to have done to it. And um, he also designed the Working Men catalogue for the National Art Gallery, which is, um, what do you call it, the creme de la creme of, mm. um, I mean, it's the height of, you know, photographic publishing and um, aura and the work and the aura of the, the published item. So what we got was, was a lot more workmanlike, um, but, it, it, you know, it fitted the it's bill really the well. Style, yeah. yeah. Except that um, the poster was a disappointment in comparison with the working men poster because it was scrunched into a much smaller size and it was full of type and words um, and the image really lost out. Um, and it didn't really function as a poster to advertise an exhibition so much as a book poster to put in um, uh, shop windows. So there was, but that, that was the, the main yeah. problem, apart from yeah, issues right. of control, yeah. you know, which is it's just something you learn. Yeah. Okay, should we um, show some images? Yeah. Did you choose the image? Did you have that for, for the, for the cover? cover? Mm -hmm. Well, there was there was a lot of discussion. Um, really, we we had a team of four people discussing some of these things, not all of them, but um, there was Brian and Martin Taylor, who was also his uh, production assistant on the. Um, catalogue and myself and Ethel and we'd look at the layout of the pages and um, typeface and all that kind of thing and the cover was discussed um, in terms of the choice of image and that kind of thing but not just not far enough down the line. Mm. I think we had final say on that cover. I think Brian gave us that. There, there was quite a lot of um, discussion between that and the first image that we're going to put up yeah. on the slide. Yeah. Um, and, it, I mean, it's a crucial choice to make for your cover image. You want something positive, attractive, you know, blah, commercial, all these things, uh, just so that you can sort of attract people to get inside, you know, that they're not alienated when they're, they're sort of looking at the front cover.
this is um, the, the photograph on the cover um, was of PE training teachers by John Pascoe in 1944. Um, this is a VE Day celebration in Wellington outside Parliament buildings um, in 1945. So it's a, it's a celebration for victory over Europe. Um, but it, it's not a very celebratory looking photograph. And I'd just like to read you while, while this works up on the wall. Um, some words from Camera in New Zealand, published in 1967 by A.W. Reid, edited by Dr. Robert Anderson and A. Leonard Casbolt. This was published the same year as Unseen City by Gary Bajant, which was published by Blackwood Paul. Um, and in Camera in New Zealand, they say, our attitudes are basically British and late Victorian at that. Pictorial photographers are particularly drawn to landscape photography, but we have to struggle against the brightness of prevailing light and general breeziness of the weather. Ideal atmospheric conditions for photography are often present for only short periods of the day or year. This limits the time in which photographers are able to obtain really effective landscapes. They must become a breed of early risers to capture the early morning haze and atmospheric effects of soft lights and mists. And after some more discussion about atmosphere and the lack of industrial smog, etc., to add to that, uh, they go on to say New Zealand society is both affluent and egalitarian. This might be regarded as disadvantageous to certain types of photography. For instance, published and exhibited photographs rather lead one to believe that many countries of the world are inhabited by toothless, wrinkled crones and bearded, pockmarked old women clothed in rags and living in hovels. This type of human interest photography is really possible in New Zealand because such subject, sorry, few such subjects exist in our midst. Um, so this kind of philosophy, that of pictorialism, which pervaded um, the camera club movement, was obviously still going strong in 1967. And this attitude is, is one of the issues at the background to the exhibition because it is really, um, with John Pascoe and people like Gary Blackman, um, contemporaries of his in the 40s and 50s, that um, there began to be a movement away from pictorialism towards what um, we now understand as uh, self-expressive or independent or personal photography, personal journalism. Um, so that there is some discussion in the catalogue Witness to Change about pictorialism in New Zealand um, and essentially the reaction against pictorialism um, we identified as also being uh, a certain reaction against um, the British um, cultural um, strength that still existed in New Zealand and a drive towards a more indigenous, a more homegrown, um, a less cliched, more direct response to what living in New Zealand was really like. Um, we were looking for other people working in this mode, um, but really all we came up with were largely these three people uh, working at a fairly high level of commitment over an extended period of time, producing a serious body of work out of a sense of deep personal commitment or obsession or whatever about their particular subjects um, outside of any commercial or professional constraints or interests. Do you want to talk some more about John? Yeah, um, yeah okay. Um, oh, we've seen this one. It's in the cover. Um, John Pascoe, uh, photograph for internal affairs during the war years. Um, he was basically a propagandist in some senses anyway. He was uh, photographing for the Labour government, I guess, and photographing their social programs. So this is apples in schools. During the war years, the uh, shipping was um, cut down, and uh, so New Zealand couldn't export apples, so they did redistribute them amongst the schools. 
Um, this is the home guard, Bunakaiki Rocks. <laughs> Presumably it's a publicity stunt, I guess, of some sort, <laughs> rather than an actual situation. This is the departure of the Maori battalion at Ro uh, Rotorua. There's quite a nice series of these as an alternative image, quite similar, which is uh, almost, well, it's very similar actually. It's, it's just, a, I mean, we had to toss up as far as the book was concerned. And there's another one here, which is not, in, not actually published in the book, but it is part of the exhibition. Okay, this isn't a PASCO, it's a, a Kurtej. We just popped in for um, some reason. That's actually, that's an image by Andre Kurtej. That image was made in First World War. Um, overseas people started using uh, small handheld cameras much earlier than in New Zealand. And in New Zealand, PASCO seemed to be um, one of the earlier ones when a lot of the professional newspaper photographers were still running around with their um, 4x5 graphlexes and so on. Um, and I thought there were interesting correspondences between the images. The second, the second one, um, in Hungary, I think. Um, yeah, no, well, I can't tell you what saying. Uh, entertainment of um, US troops at uh, Narua Wahia. They, the local Maori people put on canoe races and so forth. There's a whole series which PASCO's done on the VE and VJ uh, day celebrations. Um, this is a former Pirates Corner Wellington. This is another one here. What sort of camera did he use there? Well, he was using a roll of flex, so it's all waist level stuff. Just like that woman there. Well, I, <coughs> I think maybe she's using a brownie actually. Some other camera. He was shooting pretty fast. But also well, very considered. Yeah, he had uh, the shortages of film during war years, so he's, um, it's pretty economical actually. There's, there's very rarely more than two shots of the same thing. That'd be right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know much about this one. The, it's kind of flash. Yeah. Uh, I think it's health camp children mm. up at Okotaki, yeah. <laughs> Again, this is the Labour government's social programs, you know, health camps. Um, this is a student um, waiting to be picked up for farm work at CAS during the war years. PASCO was in, I mean, it's mainly known for his mountaineering work, so that may explain that last one. Uh, these are miners on the west coast. I think it's Buller, is it? Mm. Yeah. Um, He's, Pasco had this um, sort of semi-mystical uh, idea about the New Zealand um, character or, and about the working man or the, the natural man, I guess you might say. Uh, so he's very enamoured of the West Coast and the miners down there and all sorts of back country people, farmers and high country farmers particularly. He spent a lot of time in the high country doing his mountain. <coughs> This is one of his um, tramping mountaineering photos. There does, uh, there's, there's, I guess in the Turnbull there might be more, are there? Uh, mountaineering than... There's, so certain, there's certainly a lot of albums anyway of his mountaineering photographs. There's no doubt about that. No, I don't. No. It comes from um, the book Exploration New Zealand. Yeah, he's, he's published, he published a whole lot of books. Um, and as I say, that's mainly what he's known for, his for his mountaineering photography and his writing on mountaineering. He's quite a pioneer in that field. He, uh, as Les Cleveland says, he took the lid off something which, uh, you know, had been going along, that various people had been going out into the mountains, sort of pre-Second pre World War, uh, there were explorers and so forth. 
but Pascoe was the first really to make that uh, public, you know, to, to write about it. And, uh, you know, it, it really generated a lot more, uh, it's quite a snowballing sort of effect, particularly post-war. You mean like the King Man syndrome? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's another version of it, I suppose. But yeah. also that the exploring thing got him, the, the number of books that he was doing on exploration of history got him interested in mm, history in, in history, general, yeah. um, oral history, and the photographs were a part of this because they recorded tracks that might previously only have been gone over once or twice. So the photographs and the documentation became an important um, process for him, if you like, that I think was formative when he later on started working for the Internal Affairs mm. Department. Yeah, I think mountaineering really is a key thing in Pascoe's documentary work that it introduced him to the idea of uh, the document because he, he did a lot of research for his early books uh, in various archives and so forth and he became uh, quite aware of the need to document his own trips because many of them were pioneering the sense of various peaks and so on. He wasn't a high uh, mountain climber, he was sort of you know, a bit further down the scale, but he, um, he wrote very extensive notebooks and albums and sort of photographed, you know, took a photo at every turn along the trails. You could just about piece together his trips and these uh, were made into scrapbooks and distributed um, or available at the mountaineering clubs so other people could uh, follow his path and sort out their own trips. Uh, this is a, a you know, typical sort of backcountry type photograph of, of Pascoe's. It's not the sort of photograph that we were really interested in for our project, but he certainly took a lot of them. Uh, this is Arthur Rothstein, or was it Rothstein? Stein. Stein. Um, well, we popped this in because there are certain similarities with Pascoe's work, and there may be, there's no direct influence Rothstein to Pascoe, but there's something similar, very similar going on at the same time. And um, let's look at the next one as well, because that's also, oh, this is Bill Brandt. Have we got another one? Mm. Oh, no. Okay. So, Pascoe's is also a product of um, a documentary movement, in a sense. Um, it was something which, well, the word documentary was coined by John Grierson in relation to a film by Robert Flaherty called Moana of the South Pacific. Um, and Moana itself uh, was followed on from an earlier Flaherty film called Nanook of the North. And what you had at that time, I think, amongst many artists and filmmakers and writers and photographers, was this uh, desire to uh, sort of sociological comment, I guess, uh, exploration. Um, and in Britain you had the mass observation movement, which was a, a movement where people um, was initiated by or stimulated by anthropological work. And people thought, well, why not you know, do anthropology of our own people, of our own cities? Uh, so you had that one. What else was going on? The documentary film, the British documentary film um, thing sparked off by Grierson was also happening at that time. And it also there was the Picture Post, 1936, I think, and Life magazine ran about the same time. And uh, so, the, and then you have painters such as um, Thomas Hart Benton, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, in the States, uh, into into the social realism. And uh, who's that um, FSA painter? Ben Shan, with people. So Pasco was, you know, this was all filtering f through to Pasco in some way or another, but you know, in a very, very diffused sort of manner. I think mainly through those magazines, through Life and Picture Post. Uh, Except, what else? Well, there was the direct um, contact the with John Grayson, yeah, who yeah, film particularly, I think. came to New Zealand, uh, spent quite a bit of time in Wellington, um, helping government to establish a national film unit, which they didn't at that time take up. But he gave a number of, of important talks and was published in the Listener of the Time 
writing about documentary and exhorting New Zealand filmmakers uh, not to um, to leave aside the tourist content um, of their country <coughs> and look at people's daily lives, look at the real thing, and so on. And apparently, um, his visit, although it didn't have a direct effect on anyone, it seems, except Stanhope Andrews, who later on did work in the National Film Unit and made the film Country Lads in 19... Um, 1940. 40, was it? Yeah. Just oh. after the war started. Oh, it was quite quickly. Yeah. Uh, it did have an enormous effect on the so-called intelligentsia, particularly in Wellington, people working at the historical mm. branch of Internal Affairs, um, where John Pascoe was employed. So we were quite thrilled, really, after much searching through National Archives of um, boring files from Internal Affairs to find uh, several uh, quite elated letters and, and comments by John, John Pascoe about John Grierson's visit. Um, and in fact he was using the word documentary at that time, which in a fairly conscious way, which seemed um, significant for its time in mm. New Zealand anyway. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think the film unit was, you know, pretty much a hotbed of uh, documentary ideology really. I, I mean, I'm sure they were seeing those early Grierson and uh, films, you know, out of the British documentary movement, as well as creating their own ones, which in turn had a, you know, the, the weekly reviews and, what's the other one, the um, pictorial parade, which were very, were very widely seen in New Zealand at the time. Okay, this is Les Cleveland, we're moving on to the 50s here, uh, early 50s, uh, well I'm not sure about this one, it doesn't matter, uh, and West Coast. Again, uh, Cleveland shares some of this sort of mysticism, I suppose, about um, the back country, and he worked down there for quite a few years. He was also a journalist, um, so there's that sort of way of thinking, I suppose, you might say. Not Unlike Pasco, I think uh, there's very little uh, direct film influence or magazine influence. It was, uh, he claims he, did, you know, he never saw any books working down the west coast. There just weren't any, there wasn't anything down there. But he did see them during the war. Saw a few, yeah, overseas German magazines in the war. Uh, but I don't know. It's hard to tell really because he, he's very reluctant to to admit very many influences. So he may be telling us this and, mm. and what he knows. He says he won't play the influences game. So then, yeah, we have to piece that one again. Um, Kumara race, race Course, quite an institution on the coast. Yeah. <coughs> Same thing again. <coughs> this one was not selected for the exhibition. I think we, um, is this a cropped version or uncropped? Uncropped. Mm. No, I think the uncropped is, some of, some of these photos we, oh, we've cropped very few of them actually, um, but some of Les's we have because they're uh, pretty roughly shot. I think he, he's quite prepared to admit that, he's uh, a rather rough technician. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I can not say that. Is that an understatement or something? <laughs> he's very sort of gung ho. He's very about casual, things. yeah. <laughs> he's concerned but with content. Not he can content. get touchy about it too, perhaps at the same time. Mm. Yeah. So this is the members' bar, as you'll see in the next shot following. That's the members' bar. Mm -hmm. Again, <laughs> this is a photo which isn't in the exhibition. This one is. This is the bar of the. Commercial hotel. Uh, where is it? Kamara? Oh, I can remember. Reefton, perhaps. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. We like this for its complete and utter informality of the guy scratching his back and uh, so on. These are immigrants, uh, labourers. Uh, you notice the clogs on the man in the centre. Mm -hmm. Well, at least one of them is. They were bush pine cutters. Yeah, uh, Les was a bush cutter, 
um, <coughs> spent most of his time chopping fence posts, I think, and operating, working on sawmills in the bush. Again, this is one we didn't use. We perhaps cut down some of his, his people shots. We didn't use so many people ones by Les. We concentrate on buildings a little bit more than perhaps represents his body of work. We tended to find the, the people ones less strong. Um, what was Les taking the photos for primarily? Well, not for any specific purpose. Unlike Pascoe, he wasn't employed by anyone to do them. Um, he, well, these I think were reproduced in landfall at the time. Yes, yeah. Yeah. this one was. Yeah. Yeah. And so sometimes he'd do a small essay um, with them. Uh, and submit them for some publication. Yeah, yeah he, he were, was an early listener. And mm, so that's right. There's a, a magazine called uh, New Zealand Holidays, um, which he had um, three or four, I think, articles in, you know, quite, mm -hmm. quite big spreads, several pages of text and, you know, 15... 10 to 15 photos. But they're also quite uh, poetic. Yeah. Uh, they're sort of written in free prose style. Yeah. In particular, his book, The Silent Land, is all in, um, what would you call it? Yeah, he calls it free verse. Free verse. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it's, it's really very romantic in, in retrospect, but for its time um, in 1957, uh, mm. we haven't brushed up on our dates, <laughs> Uh, um, it was it was quite unusual. Was hmm. he he was freelancing as a journalist rather than? Well, he well, he took yeah. time out. He started yeah. off in Christchurch, um, and then he took time out on the coast. Um, and at the same time, he was doing what we now call oral history, uh, which is a long-term project where he was. Um, documenting the stories of the people that he photographed and his eventual intention was, you know, a really big publication that was a form of oral and visual history of a place that he felt was very special and that was going to disappear. Um, then in the late 50s he went back into journalism in Wellington, uh, so the later section of pictures in this exhibition are from Wellington. Um, he, he worked for the truth in the days when it was a much more of a less of a smut magazine and more of a sort of hard-nosed investigative journalism type magazine and his photographs um, were incorporated into you know these stories so and then um, I think he left journalism and went into studying politics uh, which is where he eventually finished at Victoria University or well, not finished I mean the latter part of his working life so I think it was always uh, there was always a pretty sort of vague and diffuse idea why he was taking the photographs. So, you know, he had a passion about the coast and people. Um, there wasn't it wasn't really documentary in the same way that Pasco was. Um, you know, it's quite yeah, hard. To possibly have much more of a point of view than Pasco. Mm. Yeah, Pasco's was. Well, I don't, I don't know. No, I think Pascoe's was personal as well. Um, no. It's difficult to pin down. Um, I think, yeah, we did use this in the show. It's rather mundane, I might say. Uh, it's, it's not published in the book, I don't think. It's in the set, what we call the second set of photos, which are album of photos, which we've used in the exhibition. It's the main, well, it's not the main street, it's uh, uh, Mafira Key, I think, isn't it, in uh, Greymouth. We had a look down there some time ago, it's, it, you couldn't recognise it, you know, it's, it's not like that at all, no. Dundalk Hotel. Okay, well this is a big aspect of Les's work, was these... Um, hangovers from the 19th century, and, uh, facades. He, we quote him in the catalogue about how one day he was driving or walking down the main street of Kumara, Kumara? wherever, 10 o'clock one Sunday morning or Saturday morning, and the light suddenly struck him on the front of the building. So, you know, it was some sort of revelationary experience. It was the classic moment in a photographer's yeah. history. <laughs> 
and that really, you know, was pretty key, pretty key point. Yeah. And what kept him going on these that he took some of these photos and he showed them to to Charles Brash, is it? No, it was um, the printer uh, Benson, Leo Benson. Ah, oh, Leo Benson. Mm -hmm. yeah. At Caxton um, Press. Yeah. We wrote this catalogue two or more years ago, <laughs> so hard to remember these things. Um, yeah, so Bensonman really was a, was a big encouragement to Les. Uh, again, I think Bensonman didn't really sort of have much intellectual equipment to deal with or comment on the photos, but he just said to Les, uh, keep doing it, you know, whatever, the, whatever you do, don't stop. He didn't, couldn't offer much more than that, perhaps, but he just felt that they were important, as, as did Les. So on he went and he published, you know, a few in Landfall. Well, he just kept building up an archive, basically. And I, I think Les at that point became aware of the uh, the changes happening on the coast. I think that, I guess that was a pretty important thing was that the lifestyle changing and the buildings going. That a lot of them were being demolished. The coast was a dying uh, part of New Zealand, and uh, a lot of these hotels like this one were just simply standing until they either burnt down, which is usually the case, or fell down or demolished. Uh, he moved to Wellington in the early 60s and uh, continued on, basically. Uh, this is a Hong Kong cafe in Taranaki Street. <coughs> At that stage, Taranaki Street was uh, something of a Chinese centre. Um, and it was a lot narrower than it is now, if you know Wellington at all. Uh, the street, the whole row of buildings were demolished to make the street two or three times as wide. It's a Hong Kong cafe practically opposite this current position, but we don't know if there's any connection. Mm. That's the second version. Mm. Uh, this is in the wire wrapper, I think it's mm. Masterton. Uh, yeah. Sandon mm. or Sanson. Mm. Mm. So Les, you know, did a few trips to Masterton and the lower half of the North Island in general, photographing these 19th century buildings, really at a time before the Historic Places Trust were involved in, in preserving them. You know, it was a sort of pre-consciousness era as far as historical buildings go. Uh, that's one we didn't use in the show. You know, we popped a couple of Walker Evans photos in here just to as both as a comparison and a contrast, really. It's unlikely that uh, Les ever saw any of Walker Revens or any of that tradition. I think it's fairly unlikely, anyway. Uh, why so what was the coming Well, I think it's unlikely that Les ever saw any of the Evans <laughs> photos. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying there's any influence here. Um, it's easy to look at Les's photos and say, oh, yes, Walker Evans, you know, but... He told, he told me that, um, you know, the thing he's most proud about for this book, the silent hands, yeah. the, the most exciting, or the most um, important uh, aspect of that, as far as Les Cleveland was concerned, was that um, it combines the text mm. and right. the photographs. Yeah. Which, uh, in a way, which no other magazine or no other book had done in New Zealand prior to that. Yeah. And his main model for that was, in fact, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Mick. Yes, I yes. know. Yes. Archibald McLeish. Yes. yes. You told us this. A US writer who, <laughs> who did a book called Land of the Free, which com was compiled of photographs from the Farm Security Administration. Yes, so well, I. Through I that, uh, right. Les would have known and and so on, you know. Yeah, well you mentioned this to me and I put it to Les and he hotly denies it. He says he's never seen the book. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you see, I think this, this is either part of his refusal to play the influences game. Or he did it all the time. Yeah. yeah. So and knows? yet if you piece together his life and you say, okay, he was away in the war, you know, he was in Germany for so many years from so and so and so. And so. He did let slip once that he did see some, you know, quite good German magazines, you know, good quality reproduction, blah blah. Um, but he he'd never sort of give you any names or so and so. And we're very reluctant to sort of put these kind of assumptions um, 
blatantly onto something, you know, it's too easy to do. So we just left it, really, unless it was very, we had very strong evidence. Mm. I think it's right. I mean, living down the coast most of the time, I mean, there just weren't those sorts of books available. It's really something of a backwater. There were the magazines, um, Bloody Put Life, yeah, it's Picture likely Post, you did Lilliwood. see those. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, especially later when once he's in Wellington. Um, but I think the differences, you know, between Evans and um, Cleveland are, you know, quite interesting. That there simply isn't that very formal element in Cleveland's work that Evans has. They're, they're, they're just so much looser, they're so unstructured, you might say, um, and you know, technically quite different. Um, <coughs> I feel that this might have owed something in fact in the Western and Hansel Adams, you know, that was the straight photography school. It was a, a fine, uh, quite that thick of the church with the, you know, the kind of pentecost um, yeah. in front. Yeah. Um, so, hints at uh, Adams as much as anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, that side of Adams. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, okay, well, I think what he's, perhaps if that's so, he's taking part of Adams, you know, because. I brought this US camera 1953 in to show later on. And when you're looking at Adams at that point in time, you know, you're not looking at the monographs that we see today, you're looking at the odd reproduction in those annuals or in those magazines. And so you're not really, I think, picking up on his whole philosophy, his whole approach that uh, for someone like Les, you know, there may be, he's taking something, there's a bit of an idea there, you know, facades. But he's not—he's not aware of the, the totality of Adams or, or Evans's approach. You know. Okay. Well, that's roughly the slides. Oh, I've got Anne's. Yeah. What? Anne's. Oh, Anne's. <laughs> right. So. Okay. This is Anne's Wester. Um, we popped this in first here because we thought it was um, somewhat um, unconventional image for Anne in some ways. Uh, it's fairly, I guess, it's fairly loose, you know, it's, um, she usually gets in, isolates one person, uh, and this is rather a more random sort of shot. Now, admittedly, she didn't select this. We, we selected from her contact sheets. She agreed to them, but they are our selection. So perhaps that's part of the difference. And I think that was an interesting thing that we experienced in looking at her contacts, that we were seeing things we were seeing a different Arns Wester than the one you see, the one that she's selected. That's true, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, and uh, a, a lot, because she crops frequently and, uh, you know, changes, zooms in on things and so forth, um, I, think, I think that's perhaps one of the main differences, that her original full-frame images are quite a lot less, lot less tight. <coughs> And we found preferable, really, you know, there's, uh, the less claustrophobic, I suppose you might say. So we always, for, in almost every instance, we printed full frame with her, with these images of answers. Again, with her permission, they're always discussed. The, uh, is this around the right way? Yep. Sure. Um, this is before a hungi, I think, at, I can't remember where it is. Actually, it's after, after laying it in. After, right, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there's smoke deals drying away up there. Well, there might be smoke in there. Wire are, um, early 60s, most of these are, uh, in fact, they're all taken in the early 60s, pre-1965. We chose that cut-off point for a number of reasons. I think one of them was that Anza's book, when did her book come out? 66? 67. 67, yeah. Anz did a book called Maori, which is you know, one of the sort of landmarks of her career, uh, which came out in 67. So we sort of really wanted to look at work somewhat before that. A ring or two meeting somewhere up there. Wanganui. Mm, sure. uh, is this at a hui or you know afterwards or? Um, 
It's after Maribyrnong's Welfare Meeting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is one in which we did crop, just uh, this bit on either side there. And uh, Anne's definitely would have cropped it as well, so she's quite happy with that. And the actual problem with Anne's overcropping was more to sort of loosen her up rather than yeah. um, with Les, it was the opposite because mm. he was shooting large format type photographs with a basically a small format camera, so he was getting sort of pretty weird angles and messy mm. ends and odd perspectives. So, in that sense, he needed tightening, tightening up, whereas uh, the way Arnes tended mm. to frame her work, she, she'd she always go to her two and a quarter square um, neck with a, what do you call it, a framing device and immediately start chopping it up. This and is in the dark room. In the dark yeah. room. So she shoots first and crops later, basically. And I think it was probably a hangover from her uh, camera club training is that you, in a sense, the image isn't framed in the camera, it's framed in the enlarger and that you make it into a picture once you've got into the dark room. Um, and so the cropping issue was quite a strong one mm. for Anne's. And, and we were... Sorry? You never had a square photo either. No, no. in the box, yeah. That's an important point. She was basically she was shooting for, layout. for yeah. reproduction, yeah. yeah. yeah she was um, doing a lot of photographs for a magazine called Te Aoho which is um, published by Māori Fairs Department, mm. yeah. Um, so, I mean, there wasn't a lot of work, but there was some work in that, and, uh, you know, I guess eventually working towards her main book, Māori, and she's doing the odd thing for school publications, of which the next one is an example. Yes, here we go. This is Wash Day. This is a photograph from Wash Day at the Pile, which is... Um, caused an enormous controversy in 1964, 64? around about 64. Yeah. Um, uh, we've got a copy here, I'm just going to hold it up. It's a school journal or a school, something like that. School book. So to which very dramatic, <laughs> very dramatic things happened to it because it caused, it caught, caused such a furor that the education department after I think three weeks out in the public withdrew all the copies from sale and had them guillotined. Uh, John Turner was one of the um, people with foresight around who he let them save a few copies from the, the knife. Um, so there was a very, very strong reaction from the media and from the public and as a response, the education department had to act to these photographs because at the time they were so different from, uh, and also in, in a particular context, which we will come back to later, uh, they were so controversial that um, they, you know, drew that kind of response, very vociferous. Okay, here's the contact sheet which that image comes from. Uh, top right, is it? This, this is the one she selected. Yeah. Uh, she's also actually picked these ones because a number were reproduced in the book in a smaller size, but this is the one that we selected for the exhibition. It was one of the sm smoking ones, wasn't it, as well? What's in here? Um, this was one of, the, um, one of these two frames was one of the more controversial images in the yeah. explained it to us, uh, she'd been working in Te Aoho at a school up the road um, in the previous days. She was actually looking for the cover photo of the book Māori. She wanted to have photographs of children. So she'd gone to the school and, and come up with the image and the colour, which is eventually uh, reproduced on the cover. And the next day she was trudging down some country road and uh, a couple of kids waved out to her, they remembered her from the school and um, asked her to come in, so she went in for a cup of tea um, and spent the next six hours with this family in their um, house, during which time uh, actually quite a lot happened. <laughs> she managed to do the washing um, for eight kids, hang it out, um, bake, bake some bread, 
uh, bake dinner, put the kids to bed, um, see some people down the road, her husband was off shearing, came home for lunch. A great deal happened. But, um, so perhaps it actually wasn't all in one day, but it was certainly, you can see by the way, uh, when we studied all the, <coughs> the contact sheets, you can see that there's a whole story there which emerges over a period of time which she just followed and went with. And one of the um, criticisms thrust at, or perhaps some more extreme criticisms, was that it was, you know, it was a total lie, a total fabrication that had been set up because it was so shocking um, in the social context at the time to show um, people living in these conditions, Māori people, and so on. Well, it was the substandard conditions that was um, criticism, wasn't it? Yes. You couldn't show people living in such substandard conditions. Yes. In fact, she yeah. said the, the only shot that was set up um, was one she went back the next day to get was the wasn't that, children at the, the window. Yeah. And it's actually it's raining and they've got their noses pressed against it. It's this one here. And that's the oh. only one that... Um, she actually sort of asked them to do, and the rest of it just happened. You know, oh, the child right. stood on the stove mm. to warm its feet, and she thought, oh, perhaps I shouldn't be doing that, but she photographed it anyway. So there's a lot of issues come out of that anyway, which we'll come back to later. You can see the cropping for publication in that one there. It's, it's quite a bit off the right, just basically to change it into that format in this case. Wash day stuff. Um, I don't know if any of these are in the book. Um, some. Oh, not in our book. No, no. There's, there are two this books, there's two versions. Yeah. There's the first one, and then later on, because of the controversy, um, what's that press? Caxton. Christchurch? Caxton yeah. Press published it, their own version, after the controversy had died down somewhat. With and a very the, interesting editorial. Yeah, they added some more photographs to it, extended it a bit basically. And yeah. they were um, yeah. production to it. Yeah, and they also included a, a lot of the reviews of the other book. So it gave a bit of background to the controversy in that book. It was quite remarkable that little four page leaf book, wasn't it? Mm. They had it on. Mm. We've got Xeroxes of that too if anyone wants to look at it afterwards. So more wash day. Here she is washing the clothes outside. This woman did actually die um, at the age of 49 from, I think it was a um, heart condition and pneumonia because um, she did actually obviously have quite a hard life and although in a sense it is romanticised in a way by Arns and that um, <coughs> these are the values, the family values that um, you know she felt were positive. At, it was also a condition of real poverty that um, I think Anne's, in a way, herself only acknowledged later on. I think the family feels quite good about it, don't they? Don't the kids the today kids do. think yeah. it's great? Yeah, I mean, they're grown up, obviously. Mm. Okay. <laughs> well, this is in to, as a contrast, obviously. Um, <laughs> to show you the sort of thing that we're, we're looking, you know, contrasting against. I mean, we, we didn't really have room in the catalogue to provide explicit examples. We showed one photograph from the Weekly News. This is uh, possibly published in the week. Yes, it was published in the mm -hmm. Weekly News, was it? Yep. It's taken by Bill Beatty, anyway. Um, I worked for the New Zealand Herald for many years. Yeah. So it's an example, really, of the type of photography being done in the country during the period that we're looking at. And, uh, you know, it's just to indicate what we're up against, you might say. These shapes are quite Yeah, it's birds or something like that. <laughs> this is another typical, very picturesque, uh, uh, Bill Beatty. The weekly news was... It's full of photos like this. Yeah, well, yeah. until... I forget the date now exactly, but until the mid to late 60s it was the main avenue really for publishing photographs and as Des Kelly commented, um, they even at that time hadn't really accepted the fact that um, most New Zealanders were no longer a rural people, that most of us were living in cities as urban dwellers and this rift if you like between um, 
this sort of attachment to the landscape and the photographs of landscape and the type of thing that Gary Bajant did with Unseen City was shifting focus to people's lives in the city, which was sort of more real New Zealand in a way than the sort of pastoral it all. Was, um, you know, it's one of the cultural schisms that Witness to Change is about in a way, but it also surveys that period of transition from rural to urban and from something more romantic to something more so-called realistic. Mm -hmm. So it's that sort of transition so, phase. Yeah, the, I think um, Peter Ireland pointed out that the three photographers quite neatly reflect um, some of the major social changes going on in New Zealand, uh, in, each in their own period, with PASCO and the Labour government and the you know socialist swing and the war years, women at work, all those sorts of social changes, and then Cleveland with the, indirectly anyway, the, the economic boom in the 50s. Um, these buildings being pulled down and the, the country was really not interested in its past. It was interested, you know, building hydro dams, building motorways, all these sorts of things that we now, you know, accept, take for granted, and just sort of throwing concrete everywhere, basically. It was something that you know, was very much a part of the 50s. The, the economic boom at that time, and then Barnes's photographs, um, uh, the beginnings of a, of a Maori Renaissance, I suppose, and uh, suggest the, the shift to the cities as well. Um, I, we haven't really picked, selected towards that country urban thing in her work, but it, it is there to some extent. I think she photographed more in cities in later years than the early ones. I think perhaps, yeah, coming from Holland, it was quite a, a thing to, to go out into the country for her. You know, she'd be rather doing that than working in the cities, perhaps. I don't know if she... At all? Yeah. Leave okay. the lights up. Yeah. Before we go on to stage three, does anyone want to ask any specific questions about what you've seen so far? Or? Okay, well, um, we're probably going to take a rather discursive approach to uh, some of the issues raised by the exhibition, which um, we're talking about in response to the critical reviews that were written of um, the catalogue. The main ones were um, a long consideration of the book by Peter Ireland written in Photoforum's newsletter review. Um, the second was a smaller one by Andrew Forbes in The Listener. And the third was written by Terry Morden, Terry Morden for Creative, Creative Camera in yeah. London. Um, uh, the three main problems that were perceived with the catalogue and the exhibition were questions of balance between uh, presenting a social history, if you like, of New Zealand in this period, uh, presenting a history of documentary and dealing with three individuals within that. So it's a question of balance of context against background and of how much weight was given to the three photographers against the, the background of the other photographers working at the time and against the wider social and historical background. So that was one main issue. Um, the other main issue was that of documentary, the treatment of the actual concept documentary, which is a fairly thorny well, Maybe we one. should talk about that now. Okay, so I think that's, you know, that's, that was a sort of a key misunderstanding on a number of people's parts, and I think we were perhaps partly at fault there that we weren't clear enough about it. Um, although implicitly, I think, you know, we, we did sort of outline it reasonably well with the quotes from John Grierson and mentioning the, the film connection there. Um, but what perhaps needs to be you know, understood in relation to this work is that we're looking at documentary photography rather than photographs as documents. And that you can, so people say, okay, well, what about the Burton brothers? What about all these 19th century photographers and so on and so on? You know, that you could if you're really looking at documentary photography in New Zealand, you should be looking at this whole scope. Well, okay, the Burton brothers, you can look at them as documents of 
uh, New Zealand at the time, but they were not explicitly taken. And they really, uh, there's a whole ideological difference between what was going on in the Burton brothers' heads and what was going on in John Pascoe's mind. And I think the difference is the conscious uh, concept of a documentary pho a photograph. And as I say, that you know really sprang from filmmaking, very particularly, uh, or at least it was you know well expressed in that area. And of course, you're familiar with Farm Security Administration photos and those various other uh, documentary movements uh, overseas. We, we were looking at at this work very much in the context of what we termed in the end social documentary, which stems from uh, the phrase human documentary, which came about in the 30s, particularly in America, um, partly in relation to the political situation there, and that did have a flow-on effect to New Zealand, so it was a phrase and an attitude that was abroad in the late 30s and 40s in New Zealand, which was um, enhanced by the political situation of a new Labour government coming in. Um, this, as I mentioned earlier, a greater sense of wanting to be rooted in the here and now of New Zealand life. Um, and in each of the three photographers, the, I've sort of, I feel there were three main uh, senses in, in which they were working in social documentary was firstly they each believed very strongly in the historical value of what they were doing that was um, a, a primary objective they each expressed it in their own different ways that you know uh, in the sense that the material has archival value we know things are going to change that we feel that what we're interested in at the moment there's a certain essence, if you like, that we want to capture before it changes. Um, secondly, that they each had their own personal obsessions, if you like, that they were prepared to to follow in the way that um, Burton Brothers or Kinder or Barker uh, didn't to the same extent because they their conditions were narrowed more mm. to ones of personal interest or commercial. Yeah. Well, this is, the, this is where Grierson comes in with his uh, famous statement uh, documentary is the creative treatment of actuality. actuality. So, uh, mm -hmm. There's another few quotes from around too. But, um, basically, what he's saying is that um, you take reality, whatever it happens to be, and you add emotion to it. Um, and I think that's the difference you know, between the Burtons and the Pascoes and the Clevelands, that they all did have this idea that their photographs were in some way um, you know, some sort of expression of themselves that they, their personal values were going into the and they were uh, well aware of that fact. And that was really coming from that, uh, you know, those various overseas sources, I think, as well as things which were happening at the time. And I was also going to say, I think it's quite interesting to, to look at this, you know, idea of realism, which was developing because it's also seen in, say, the Bauhaus photography, you know, the, um, although they're doing montages and so on, um, they were very much well, against painting. You know, the painting was sort of of the past. You know, we needed to look at the future. We need to look at the machine, the sort of cold, hard reality, the factual thing. And then, you know, you do things with those. Um, there are new new objectivity in Germany and Ed uh, Western and so on uh, in the States. And I think Western also said something about painting was irrelevant or dead or useless or something similar, you know. So, you know, there's very, very wide, I think, uh, you know, change in consciousness in the 20s and 30s. Mm. The, the, the third aspect, which um, I was going to mention, which carries on from this sort of sense of personal obsession, is a strong um, humanist concern, mm. which each three photographers shared, that uh, in terms of social documentary then, um, their interest was in, well there's all kinds of ways of describing it, giving a voice to, showing the invisible, allowing the ordinary, <coughs> ordinary man to speak, um, showing the ordinary man's way of life as opposed to the ones on top. And this is something that John Pascoe talked about quite a lot <coughs> when he was um, producing illustrations of New Zealanders <clears throat> for a book called 
was it Making New Zealand, a centennial mm. publication for 1940, <coughs> the centre spread instead of um, chronicling the politicians and the, the leading figures and names of the day, <coughs> identified a range of average New Zealanders by occupation, by age group, by character type, um, in a way that was quite unusual for its time and seemed to have certain um, precursors overseas. So each of these people, uh, photographers, were going into an area that they wanted to show a wider audience. This is how this group of people live. This is how the West Coast Coasters live. This is how Maoris really live. Um, it was always so somebody on. else though, wasn't it? You no, know, I mean, they weren't photographing their own milieu. Okay, well that's, that's, the, yeah, yeah. that's the other point, is that um, down. Yeah, the other discussion is about context um, and our approach to this, this um, concept of documentary. Um, I think Peter Ireland and um, what's his name, Forbes, yeah. Andrew Forbes felt um, that <coughs> we were sort of somehow trotting out um, the, the orthodox view of documentary sort of 1930s style in the 1980s. But what we were concerned to do with this catalogue was, one, make it accessible to a wider audience than the very small photographic audience and art gallery audience. So we wanted an, a non-academic approach to our subject matter, which is um, part of the reason for the social history. The other reason for the social history was to draw the context from where these people came out of. And what we were concerned to do was, at the time, we felt there's been nothing else done exactly like this, of this era, of these people. Um, there's been research done into early periods of New Zealand photographic history, 19th century, early 20th century. And um, most of us who study photography are reasonably well versed in terms of American photographic history. It's what we've been brought up on, British, European. But where is our recent New Zealand photographic history, the last 20 odd years prior to you know, ourselves being involved? Um, so we were interested to, to get that down, to record it and get it down so that we could go from there. So that, that was the first impulse was to um, look at this previous generation and get as much material out of them and people from the milieu as we could, put it down within its context that we weren't concerned with an evaluation from, from our perspective and we're very conscious in a way of being um, the younger generation, like with the Les Clevelands of this world, it's very difficult to sort of go up to them and, you know, do, a, do an art historical number on them and, and you know, you so just... You can do that from dead people. <laughs> Very difficult when you know you're working um, with people who have their artistic egos intact, and I mean, understandably, you know, you don't want these sort of naive juveniles sort of tramping all over you. So there was a certain sensitivity to that aspect of it. Um, John Pascoe is dead, but we were dealing with his uh, widow and people that he had worked with. Um, which in a sense made it more difficult um, because we couldn't ask him the sort of question, ask them the sort of questions we wanted to ask him about issues that have been raised by reviewers such as censorship, propaganda, you know, freedom, I mean how far his intentions went. Uh, we went as far as we possibly could in research and talking to people but beyond a certain point you're making assumptions. Um, so we were sort of careful to draw the line between recording factual material, oral history if you like, getting it down, getting it down in terms of the way they expressed it, the way they saw it, not the way we saw it, mm. uh, rather than evaluating it from our perspective. Um, and I think the main fault there was that we didn't spell out more what documentary meant to them more explicitly in, in terms of its time. And I think in its context it did tend to mean that uh, one class of people tended to um, go and study another class of people who tended to be of a lower social and economic status. In the 1980s, as a documentary photographer, that's a minefield. And, you know, you, you just don't simplistically go out there and say, you know, that you're 
going to express the sort of human essence of these people or whatever that, um, I mean, we just had an interesting discussion in Wellington on the weekend with um, a visual anthropologist who did an analysis of working men um, by Glenn Bush. Um, and I suppose that the, the basic criticism was that he was continuing this tradition which she cannot sustain in the 1980s of sort of turning another group into some kind of noble savage. Yeah, it's a sentimentalised, yeah. yeah. So this was a criticism that has dogged the work of Anne's Wester, for instance, um, less so the work of Pascoe in Cleveland. And um, we were certainly aware of it when we were doing the work, when we were doing the book. Um, but the main energy at that time was going to putting it into context and getting it down and perhaps we were too hesitant or reticent to sort of stand back and make more value judgments or go into more of a philosophical analysis of what documentary meant and how its meaning has shifted in relation to social changes and photographers' roles in the last 40 odd I, years. I think the photographers themselves all sort of saw themselves, you know, as auteurs. I mean, we don't know about Pasco, but the other two to some degree, and you know, were pretty reluctant to, uh, you know, be sort of put down in, into a social context and say, oh, well, you know, this person was, uh, you know, influenced by this or that, and, uh, you know, that they were social products of their, of their own time and so on. I think Arne's was as uh, reluctant as Leah's, really, in that score. Mm -hmm. She just sort of felt that she, you know, picked out a, up a camera one day and started taking photographs. It I sort of didn't really much want much. to sort of look at what you're doing or mm. know about it, you know, and that's, that's it's, understandable. Yeah. It's very, quite tense, really. Mm -hmm. So I think we push it as far as you can while maintaining, you know, fairly cordial relations. Yeah. Um, nice. Do, has anyone had anything to say at this point? So we've been talking for a long time. Does anyone no, have any questions? I'd like to say I think that what you did was very appropriate because part of the problem that I think the Aussies are particularly suffering from is that you do um, an awful lot of writing about photography but they don't actually publish the work they're talking about. They just mm. show a sample. Mm. So <coughs> certainly on the outside of it, all you can do is uh, read a review and look at a couple of pictures and try to understand from that. And it's, it's all top heavy with the, the cart before the horse. And I think what you're doing was, uh, and it's legitimate, was to establish that X, Y, and Z did work in this period, and this is the kind of work they did, and this is the sort of context. And I personally don't think this is such a huge problem, and I don't go along with some of the criticism that the book I can show receive. Well, I think we um, could have done more. Because there's plenty of other information about the documentary tradition. I don't mm. see why you should have to no. rewrite what William Stock did, for instance, no. you know, when he brings in no. radio and all that, which is fantastic. Maybe yeah. doing another whole catalogue. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that wasn't the point of the exercise, but yeah. it, I, I, it, I, it I, perhaps I, needed rooting a little bit more and uh, stating our position more clearly than yeah. perhaps we did, it so that they knew, you know, reader knew where we were coming from. It all depends who your reader is, you know, you, you can't aim at it every single person out there, you know, you just have to make certain assumptions, which we did. But I, you know, I do regret, I think, having, not having a few more photos, particularly of the way that the work was used at the time, you know, we could have published, say, some spreads from Wash Day, or more particularly the other school journals, and Te Aho and um, The Silent Land, and various other things, you know, because I think that is, you can see straight away, we're aware of the books, they're part of the exhibition, but they're not in there in the catalogue. And I think, well, it's simply a restriction on, on money, you know, it costs money to print the photos, so we really cut down. But, you know, you could argue that we perhaps highlighted the main photos rather too strongly, really. Yeah. Um, okay, we've got to speed up. Okay. Um, oh, well, we'll just it. Any other questions? <coughs> Well, there's one other thing I'll add, that's a criticism by Andrew Forbes of history as mythology, that he's saying that we are um, setting out to create a history of New Zealand with these photographs, and you can take that interpretation, but it was actually, the intention was really the other way around, that we were trying to 
outline, you know, very simplistically some sort of history of New Zealand with a, a brief chronology, uh, a contextualising essay by Wayne Stagg, who was a history student, and then popping the photos in there and uh, seeing the photos as reflections of that whole social content. But I think, you know, it is, it is possible to look at the other way around and say, you know, looking, you, you can, if you think of photos as windows, then you could mistake our, our book as uh, attempting to set up something where you where it's trying to be a history of New Zealand. And I think while that, you know, unavoidably was part of our motivation, uh, you know, it wasn't really the main thrust at all. Okay. But I think we could have done more contextualisation. You know, we tried, we did try to present the, the, the individual photographers as individuals. And for various reasons, I suppose, because we felt that they hadn't really had their due in various ways. But it does provide a, a bit of a distortion in that you don't see a whole uh, you know, social situation. You just sort of highlighted individuals as artists, uh, which is, you know, I think it's a little bit distorting. But it's, um, it's a matter of personal preference, I suppose. They could be another book, well, that's right. That's that's really the difficulty. You know, like we really see this as an introduction of some sort. Uh, Not a survey. Yeah, I mean, we say that clearly. So, because well, you're really working from ground zero or something like that. You know, that uh, so it's a matter of getting something up there and out, and that's a starting point for other people. Hopefully, it's you know, filling in one little gap. I mean, in particular, um, Don Pesco and Anne Foster have you know could easily sustain one of that on their own. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a question of putting them in their context too. And in fact, for in the time that we were doing it, I mean, there was actually a two-year lead-up period. It was, um, in terms of the research and writing, it seemed more unusual then to do what we were doing than it yeah. is now. So that's yeah. the difference that there has been in, what, three years, is that, um, you know, you require more context and more backgrounding. Uh, but even so, you're not getting it um, directly through art gallery publications. I mean, they're still sort of treating the artist as some kind of rarefied animal who... Disembodied. You know, you can sort of treat in terms of mathematical precision. Um, the background is it's sort of there as background, but it's not really real life. Um, and somehow we wanted to break that down a bit, or sort of warm it up a bit or something. Mm. Any questions? The people photographs, the dreamer ones that you've left, um, did they sort of continue that feeling of mysticism on the West Coast? Well, not in, the, <laughs> not in themselves. I mean, this, the mysticism is an interpretation you make of, of Les' attitudes, perhaps well, looking at the entire body of, or, you oh, know, no, whatever. No, there's I'll... definitely a, a romanticism from a European male perspective of, you know, European male sort of kind yeah. of yeah. standing out in front of the body yeah. there. I mean, as, as Wayne Stagg pointed out, it's a very ethnocentric, Eurocentric sort of typical pioneer image in some ways of, of you know, what New Zealand, um, European New Zealand is, yeah. what their experience has been in the last 150 years. It was, it was very much to do with that. Something of a South Islanders idea of New Zealand, isn't it? Mm. I just wondered, leaving out of those, it didn't um, throw more emphasis with the buildings of the Canadian Parks and that kind of it was a very difficult balance to strike. I mean, I think, you know, uh, with each of those photographers, when you've got such a large body of work, in particular arms, mm -hmm. um, well, actually, no matter how large your body of work is, you still, if you're trying to somehow distill it into 12 images, or in this case, we, we coped in the exhibition, we actually had 72 images, but only 36 framed on the wall. And the second set of 33 were presented in albums, which actually were one of the more interesting aspects of the exhibition, I think, for us and for viewers, uh, is that they worked quite well. Uh, we call them our second set. Um, 
and work that for various reasons wasn't in the first set went into the second set because um, that's his best known publication but some of those images we put up have been published in Landfall and we wanted if possible to extend um, the awareness of their work rather than just reinforce what had already sort of been seen um, <clears throat> and so after that sort of weeding process what we left with with Les's work was a balance of perhaps a quarter photographs of people, <clears throat> I think, and also there were a lot of technical problems with him, yeah. because he'd be photographing in low light situations like the interior of the pub, for instance, he'd be inside a sawmilling factory or whatever, um, so we had to sort of balance those against what we, uh, you know, this, which is a strong image and what says more and all that sort of thing. Uh, Terry Morden. Yes, well, well his, his basic um, um, criticism, I guess, was that's what I was saying, that we were treating them as auteurs, you know, as individual autonomous <coughs> artists. And rather than doing a history of documentary photography in New Zealand, we'd simply picked three people out and really given them very high emphasis and then tried to put them back into a context rather than sort of doing it the other way around. And I think, you know, that's true, that's fair enough. But I think what perhaps he doesn't understand, what a lot of other people don't understand, and we did state it, um, was that there was so little other work of a similar nature being done in the country, you know. Um, Tom Hutchins stuff disappeared, George Shaw went overseas pretty smartly, and Gary Blackman didn't do all that much. He took two or three rolls of film pre-1965 or something. Mm -hmm. Well, a few Brian dozen at the most. Country. Brian Brake mm -hmm. went away, yeah. His, I mean, his, um, what is it? Beautiful New Zealand book. Um, <laughs> Gift, the, of the Gift of the Sea. Gift of the Sea is well known, you know, so there's not much need to publish that again. I mean, there and probably is more work there, but it's a sort of second layer, if you like, and we were working yeah. on the first layer. It was, even though it was an enormous amount of work, it's still what was relatively accessible. And being in Wellington mm. certainly helps because mm. so you've got the national collections right there and we had the photographers there. And I must admit that that was another factor in a certain way because we simply didn't have the money to um, travel around the country to look at other collections, to see other people, to spend time in Dunedin with Gary who actually was overseas for 18 months or something. So all of those kind of factors affect the way the thing takes shape, you know, when you're in the planning stages. And given what we found out since, do you think there are any serious omissions? Or was there somebody um, else in there rather than one of those three? Or? No one's rushed up and said, mm -hmm. look, you've yeah. overlooked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, we were, we were actually very interested in Gary Blackman's work. I mean, it's very, in many ways, he's, um, he was more sophisticated visually and intellectually about where he was at and what he was doing in a lot of ways. And uh, he's a, you know, a very interesting person with a broad knowledge of both arts and sciences and he was you know, operating at an interesting time in, in New Zealand art and photography. Um, but his actual output in the period that we were looking at was relatively low. Um, it sort of wasn't... A, it just wasn't, there wasn't enough there to sustain, you know, the kind of selection that we needed to draw from. There weren't 500 plus images. Um, I mean, later on he produced the Victorian City, um, you know, which is an interesting product of uh, one aspect of, of a documentary intention. Um, what date was that? 67? Oh, no. Yeah. And he was, um, and he don't he doesn't consider those his so-called serious pictures. I mean, there uh, a lot of it was actually colour slide work, which he used for slideshows, and it was it was um, overtly propagandist in the way that his black and white pictures are, are much more considered um, so-called artistic, and there's much fewer of them. 
you have mentioned what I thought was a really interesting comment. It was Terry Gordon who said who yeah. gave it a prayer for Canada. Yeah. And to me, one of the most interesting things <coughs> that he said was actually to, to point out that um, if um, by you know chance or fate those three photographers were working in England, <coughs> they would be better known internationally than they are. Mm. We are also interested to realise too that probably apart from the copy which he reviewed, it's not likely that anyone else in Britain has seen the book at all. I mean, we're unaware of any sales being made to anybody in Britain. That's quite interesting, I think. So, you know, a book which gets quite a decent sized review in quite a prestigious magazine. That actually, no one who reads that review, apart from us in New Zealand, is ever going to see the book. That was a good book, did you see that? Yeah, we actually sent it to the Creative Camera. Yeah. I mean, we would have liked to send more overseas, but it costs quite a lot of money, so mm. two or three people got <laughs> you know. Yeah. Incidentally, uh, I've been told that, but I, I used to send off about 20 copies. Oh. And, uh, oh, and made it overseas, and the, the response was very, very positive. You know, people were very interested in that. Mm -hmm. People in the states and in Europe. I was going to see a lot of, a lot of, yeah. yeah. They were very warm and interested in both wines and other people. Very interested. I, th I think quite a number did find their way overseas, partly because the thing was subsidised so that it was so damn cheap yeah, right. yeah, so that you know right. it was it was a really good deal, and but, that's partly why it's um, sold out beyond all the expectations, um, you know, because we were sort of struggling about the number of the print run and, not, you know, could we sort of lump 20 copies on each go room for how much? I mean, all of the agonising that goes into those kind of financial decisions beforehand, um, it's quite interesting, you know, and it looks like when and if the exhibition does get to Auckland, there won't be any catalogues to accompany it. <laughs> so this is the plug. <laughs> There's seven left over there. Uh, as far as we know, this yeah, that's probably about it. Yeah. Thank you. How did government life feel about it at the end of the day? <coughs> well, I'm not really sure. I, th I think they they did get their money's worth in terms of coverage. Um, Are they, did they feel that? I don't know. Um, apparently, they've had since that happened. They had was it three. <laughs> approaches a week or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think it was two or three a day. Oh, a day. No, yeah. no, just arts groups, um, yeah. people looking for funding. So it was successful. It's, a, it's obviously a very, very competitive um, business. Yeah, you know, going for sponsorship. Yeah. 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 yeah, and I think they didn't really want to do something similar. I think that was the problem, wasn't it? Well, they were, try they were trying to, they had thought, okay, we've got to sit down and devise a policy on what our sponsorship situation is in regards to arts and so on. And they're a much more high-profile company now because they're mm. more commercial. Mm. Um, yeah, we were just lucky that they were at that point in time. They had some pretty vague ideas about sponsorship. They came along and, you know, it happened. But they, weren't, they didn't interact together really very much and they didn't really know what they wanted, I think. We really told them what they wanted, you know, in terms of publicity. What's your, um, your, uh, your, your yeah, really yeah. Publicity sold it. Mm. But I think we knew more about publicity than they did, you know, in other ways. That's the shooky. Yeah, I mean, coming up from the industry, traditionally, yeah. you never had to seek those. Mm. That's right. Mm. No. Mm. Well, we were surprised, though, so on business side, like, really. <laughs> is there no definite plan you're in Auckland or not? Yes, I was told that the Fisher is definitely going to have it. It's a lot of folks who go about a month ago and they were quite very, um, that was a sort of curated there. Do you know? Well, it's interesting that um, it's very hard to keep control of a touring exhibition and uh, we're not really informed. I mean, it's, it's no longer. As far as I know, she, she indicated she didn't have an exact, exact date, but it looked like this was about a month ago. She was looking at what I perceived as a two or three month period. Later this year. Yeah, in, in two or three months' time from then. So I presume for the next three months we'll probably see it at the Fisher. Yeah, as far as I know, it's, it's been underneath and 
in Christchurch, so it's still got Gisborne and the Dallas and Lower Hutt. And perhaps they won't take it now, I don't know. Mm. So then it will come to Auckland. Mm. What happens at the end of it? It's owned by the National Art Gallery. Right. Yeah. I've got one last question. It pertains to uh, Peter Ireland's review of um, Swester's book, Fiora, when that came out, and, you know, which Peter was virtually saying that, you know, didn't you know everybody that documentary photography was dead? And I just wonder what your views were on that. Were on that. Um, well, it was a question I was tempted to ask Lawrence MacDonald on Sunday because um, this is a visual anthropologist talking about Glenn Bush um, because it, uh, he made it sound like a morally defunct activity, actually. You know, that it was simply not possible. Uh, physically or morally or aesthetically for a photographer to operate like that anymore and I, I personally find that quite difficult but um, I think Athel should probably respond to this because he's just done an exhibition um, at the National Art Gallery on politics and photographs which does deal with some of these issues. Well I don't have much to say but I, I do think there, there are endless possibilities really that I mean, the work of Alan Secura and Martha Rosler, you know, suggests new, new directions, and I think things are changing all the time. So that uh, documentary photography of a certain type, you know, which evolved in a certain era, e.g. Farm Security Administration, may well be defunct. I think it's, you know, it's no longer tenable, and Arns' early work isn't really tenable, you know, in this day and age of this Maori Renaissance that we see. So. Things do change, but I don't think it doesn't mean you can't take photographs which are in some sense documentary, just the definition of it, of it changes, basically. I tend to think it's actually the photographers and the artists who validate and make things tenable and otherwise, mm. and in that sense, the art critics can go to hell, you know, because mm. they, you know, they're not the ones who do the work. So, you know, I, I uh, personally didn't find Ireland's comment very It's a matter of being aware of the issues, basically. The photographer has to deal with those internally. So I guess what I would say is that you can't be, you can't not be aware, or be not aware of them. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there's well, just... You can be not aware of them. Well, but if you are, you no. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I think you're open, open to criticism, basically, if you haven't got an answer. You know. If you're not going to be politically correct, then you're just, you know, you've got to be really careful. Yeah, or utterly naive.
before their time or ahead of their time. You know, and it really shows that most photographers really are of their time, very much of mm. their time. And it's, I would suspect it's actually possible to be ahead of your time. Mm. So what I'm trying to get at is that what Pasco was showing is probably quite a good measure of what many people are thinking about at the end of their time. Mm. As was Westrus yeah. and, and now you and as was um, as Cleveland as well. So in other words, I want to say there's a there's an aspect of typicality mm. in the work. Mm. And it's an aspect that we as contemporary photographers often like to ignore or yeah. deny. Because you know, we don't like to think really we're just one of the mob. Mm. We like to think that we're a hill of the mob, but uh, I don't find that it happens very often. <laughs> And going back to Burton and Alfred Burton also the same thing. It's very much of this time. Yeah, I absolutely, you know, absolutely agree. I think that's you know what we were saying before about Les and Nans. You know, they, they really do find it a bit objectionable to to think that they weren't you know some sort of well, Les particularly, I think, likes to see himself as uh, yeah, voice in the yeah uh, you know, he's doing novel things and so on. I mean, he does really push this business about silent lands combination of text and pictures. And he sees it as very important development. And I think he just did, well, has forgotten or ignored, you know. But they did have a very strong feeling of work in isolation, which mm. I don't think is so much the case now. Well, it's mm. just relative. And relatively, there is less of a vacuum than there was then. And that was one of the things that we wanted to sort of, you know, make evident and how much things have changed. Yeah, I, yeah. From my own research, I, I don't think they're actually all that, all that isolated. You know, it's, it's a little bit like, you know how, it's quite remarkable, you, you get overseas business here and you're guessing on about Yankee photography from to the end, <laughs> and you're telling them names they don't even know. Yeah. You know it's quite embarrassing sometimes, and I'm sure you've found this too, mm -hmm. that in some group, for some reason, being over here makes us more interested in what's going on over here, so we kind of do our own work more. Mm. And I've found this time and time again, mm. and uh, I can't help but wonder um, that Cleveland, Westbury, and others, you know, in fact, probably took in by osmosis a lot of other people's work. Oh, they did. You know, through yeah. magazines, especially through oh, yeah. the indicator. And, just and yet, so many of us, we, if you've pushed to name those photographers, you name those pictures that have influenced you, mm. even to acknowledge the influence, it's quite a difficult thing to do. Mm. And I think this memory, uh, as well as ego, that comes into it, yeah. you know, forgetting what influenced yeah. you. Well, that's, you know, as I see, the US camera, because those photos just do meld into the pages so easily by Adams and Minor White and all sorts of names. They, uh, you know, I mean, it's no way that someone could remember 30 years ago when they saw an Ansel Adams photo at a certain time because they just weren't, you know, prominent enough in those books, I think. I mean, that's one reason. Maybe we should stop now. Yeah, I think we'd better stop. <laughs>